welcome to the last session of the day. Uh, don't wait for Godot. Build a game today with Paris Butfield Addison. Dr. Paris Butfield Addison is co-founder of Secret Lab, a game development studio based in Hobart, Tasmania, Australia. <laughs> I like how that's on the... In this talk, Paris will teach the fundamentals of the completely free open source game engine Godot. It's powerful, amazing, runs on everything, and there's never been a better time to learn. Please welcome Paris. Thank you, that's awesome. Oh, yeah, I have a PhD in computing that I've miserably failed to use for anything useful, so that's not important for this talk. Hi, I'm Paris. Uh, I run a studio called Secret Lab, where we're best known for a game called Night in the Woods, which attracted a lot of fans uh, a few years ago. Uh, but we also build lots of narrative video games, lots of video game tools, all sorts of things. Uh, and I am here today to talk about a game engine which we're increasingly starting to look at and increasingly starting to use called Godot, Godot, God Godot, depending on how you pronounce it. Uh, it's obviously named after the play, which I saw Sir Patrick Stewart in a few years ago. He pronounced it Godot. So I'm going to go with Godot, because Patrick Stewart. Reasonable? OK. So this is my company, Secret Lab. Has absolutely nothing to do with the talk. I just wanted to show you the pretty pictures we made. This is the Godot website. I'm going to, I have no slides, by the way. I'm just going to do things, and hopefully it'll work. So I have a copy of everything that works if everything miserably falls apart. And I'll be copying and pasting some code if I give up typing. But other than that, we'll see how it goes. So, I put this website up just because the starting point for everything I'm about to do, this is not a tutorial, please don't try and follow along, you'll, you'll melt. Um, all I did was I downloaded Godot 4. I said there's never been a better time to learn. I said that a few months ago when I submitted this talk. It was true then, but it's truer now because Godot 4 just came out. <laughs> Very true. I had to rewrite the whole talk around Godot 4, but that's fine. Today, I'm using the .NET version of Godot. Okay? For a very specific reason, that's because most game developers in the world who use Unity will have been very familiar with C-sharp. And Unity is a very big popular game engine. And I think Godot supporting C-sharp is a really good way to bring people over from the big proprietary engine. So I have been learning, I know C-sharp very well from Unity. I've been learning C-sharp for Godot over the last few months, getting better at it. And I decided to have a crack at doing it in C-sharp this time. Normally I would teach GDScript, which is the other programming language. But everything I'm about to teach you is translatable, all the using Godot bits are the same. So, all I did to get started here was I downloaded Godot for my Mac, the .NET version, and then I went and downloaded the .NET SDK from Microsoft. Godot technically supports the Mono SDK, but I think that's not officially deprecated, but basically deprecated now. I downloaded .NET 6, I think it supports both though. Uh, with that out of the way, I thought I'd just quickly show you, this is what GDScript looks like, it's kind of like Python, but it's an internal programming language that Godot made. It's great, it's really cool, if you're happy to never touch C-sharp, using Godot through this is perfectly fantastic. Possibly better, because it's tightly integrated with the editor. With that, I'm going to go to Godot, and now we're going to make a project live, hopefully, and not mess it up. So I'm going to talk you through how it works. Uh, Godot is very lightweight, so Unity is this thing that consumes multiple gigabytes of your RAM and takes forever to download. Godot is like 100 megabytes and just runs. Doesn't have contact any sort of licensing servers. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a breath of fresh air. So I'm going to make a new project here. I'm going to call it uh, Live Platformer. And I'm going to put it on my work drive. So we're just going to go Volumes, Work. And then we're going to go here and select this folder and we're going to go create folder. So it's made a little platformer folder. I'm going to leave it on the renderer. We don't care about that right now. And then I'm going to go create an edit. And because Godot is written in Godot, it's going to relaunch itself. It's slightly quirky. And we end up with this. So everything in Godot is a scene. Godot works with scene files. Scenes are an area of your game where you've put something. Scene files also get stored on disk, which I'll show you in a minute. But basically scene files are a thing which you work with and put stuff in. The contents of scenes are called nodes. So everything in a Godot scene is just a node tree. It's just a tree of stuff, in an, all called nodes, saved in a scene. Other scenes can be embedded within scenes in Godot, and you'll see how that works as we go through. But basically, everything in Godot is a scene with a node in it, and multiple nodes. And nodes have nodes under them, and so on and so on. So we're going to make a little game. We're going to make a little platform game, like a traditional little runny, jumpy platform game, as quickly as we can. One thing I'm going to do that I forgot to do is I'm going to go here and go, this folder that I've got here full of assets and I'm going to copy it into the folder I just made. So what did I call it? I called it Live Platformer. I'm going to drag this Assets folder in and these notes in, which I'll show you later. And because I put a folder full of assets in, these assets are just a bunch of sprites as PNGs, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, because I put a, a folder in, God is going to figure it out and put it in this sidebar over here. So it knows we've got some assets. OK, so with that in mind, I'm going to start. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a player, something to run around in our little scene. Uh, to do that, I'm going to go over here, and where it says create root node, it's going to ask me what kind of node I want to be the root of this new empty scene it's given me. 
And because we want a player, we're going to create a different kind of node. We're going to actually click other node, and then Godot gives you this list of stuff where you can pick from what kind of node you want. And we're going to get a character body. So you can filter at the top. Can everyone see that OK? Is that visible? Yep, cool. Basically, you, you learn to kind of do it very fast and just type the kind of node you want, and it eventually gets there. But I'm going to do it slightly slower. So I want a character body 3D, which is a specialized kind of node that can be moved around with script. So because Godot has a full physics engine, like most game engines these days, it mostly defaults to letting you move things with physics. So like if you give something, tell it to fall, it falls. We don't really want that to happen with the player character because we want to manually be able to move it around the environment. So character body 3D, 2D is a, uh, that kind of object. If you play with other game engines, this might be called a kinematic body. So we now have this scene over here, which has at its root a single node called character body 3D. I'm going to click that and push return or enter and rename it to player. Very straightforward. And now I'm going to add some other nodes below it. So to add other nodes below it, I can either right click on it and go add child node, or I can just click the plus button while it's highlighted. Okay. First node I'm going to add is an animated sprite 2D. This is a sprite that can be animated, basically. Uh, I'm going to name its player sprite. So here we have a tiny tree in this node. And I've lost my mouse, which is very exciting. I wonder where my mouse has gone. Um, yeah, it has. I'm just going to disconnect that and reconnect it. Is that going to cause a problem for your recording? Let's do that. Yep, that's unfrozen. OK. Computers, eh? I've now reconnected it, and I see nothing. There we go. OK. You back? OK. Cool. No idea what happened. My mouse just stopped working, which is always very exciting. Anyway, player sprite has a, uh, an anim it's, it's able to be animated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this player sprite node on the left here and then go over to the inspector on the right, which shows you the properties of the thing you've currently got selected. And the thing we want to change is the animation. So we want to expand that animation, and then it's got sprite frames empty. So this is where you place an asset. So if you had an animated set of sprite frames, you could drag that in there. We don't have that yet. We're going to make it. So we're going to click New Sprite Frames. And we're going to click that asset. And down the bottom, we get this little inspector thing where you can fiddle with what the actual animation looks like. So I am going to add an animation here. I want to have an idle player animation. So those assets I dragged in earlier include a bunch of animations for moving and idling and so on. One of them is a nice little sprite where the player just sits there. So you'll see here we have idle. So you'll see here we've got the sprites that make up an idle animation. They're just one file, standard animation thing. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So what we're going to do is we want to say up here, horizontally we go eleven and one. One. And you'll see it's put lines between them at the rate I just told it. And now I can select them all and add them as frames to the project. So now we have this little animation. I happen to know this is a 20 FPS animation because I've been playing with it for a while, but you might need to fiddle with that if you didn't make the animations. Uh, we're going to rename that animation to idle in the bottom there. And we're going to click this little button here, which says it plays automatically. And now my mouse has stopped working again, which is very exciting. I have no idea what's going on. I'm going to move my computer over here. So I hopefully stop leaning on it. And try. Yeah, it's just one. It did not do this earlier when I tested. is not good. Let's try again. Yeah, it starts working the second the thing is not plugged in. We shall see, we shall see. Okay, so we're back. For now, we've got this idle animation here with a 20 FPS set. We're going to click this little button which says please run it all the time. There's this button here. And then we're going to click the player sprite up here and then push F, which is going to focus it on the editor. And then we're going to zoom in and we can see this little player sprite, and then we click play, and it works. So you might notice if you play pixel platformer games, this doesn't look particularly good. It's not like pixel perfect. To fix that, we're going to go to the project settings up here and set the renderer to uh, nearest on the texture filtering, just so it doesn't try and do any sort of fancy filtering, and then it'll look nice and pixel perfect. So if you're doing a pixel art or a 2D game, you might want to do that sort of thing. Haven't got time to explain what that means. Come and find me later if you want to talk about it. Basically, you need to do that for kind of pixel-perfect rendering. Anyway, we have this one single sprite with an idle animation. Uh, that's all we need to do right now. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to save that scene. So I'm going to push Command-S or Control-S on Windows. And it's going to ask me for a name. It's going to call it Player. So I'm just going to save that as Player. Now that scene file with the node structure that we've just made is saved out as a file on disk. 
So I'm going to make another scene up here with the scene menu, new scene. I'm going to use the 2D scene root node that Godot offers me. And I'm going to rename it level. This is going to be our level. So we're going to make a traditional little platform environment for our player to live in. To do that, we're going to use something called a tile map. A tile map is a way of bringing in a whole bunch of sprites in one nicely compressed, neat little PNG, and then picking which bits mean what and using that to lay out a level. Godot has fantastic tile map support. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a child node. The mouse has stopped working yet again. Does anyone have a USB-C to HDMI adapter by any chance? That's probably what's causing this problem, I would imagine. Yeah, only one port. It's only one port. This is very frustrating. It's the whole keyboard freeze, the whole computer freeze, it's not just the mouse. Anyway, I'll keep going while we fiddle and then we can see if we can fix it. Luckily, I'm not doing any sort of fancy things with the screen. So I have a level sprite, I'm going to add a tile map node. Okay, so I've added a tile map node. I'm very sorry, this is very frustrating. Ooh, let's try this one. How exciting, thank you. Please forgive me. Thank you. Appreciate you. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Let's try that. Love, I love computers. Don't we all? Okay. I've added a tile map node. A tile map is basically a fancy version of a, uh, a sprite, an animated sprite like I was using earlier but lets you have multiple sprites within it that define different areas. So down here, you'll see we have this empty thing at the bottom. So once again, I'm going to create an asset over here on the right and say I would like a new tile set. A tile map works with tile sets. We're going to select that tile set, and then we're going to drag in the, uh, the resource I've provided you. Tiles packed over here, and just put it here. It's going to say, would you like to automatically create the tiles? Yes, I would. And then I'm going to drag this up and set this to 18 by 18 because I happen to know that's the resolution of the tiles in this thing. So now we have this tile set here, which has a bunch of tiles in it for a standard platformer. So you can kind of select them all and they're all independent tiles. Okay. So I'm going to use that to lay out my level. So I'm briefly going to make a little level here. So I'm going to go tile map and then I'm going to use the painting tool here. I'm going to save this scene as level and then I'm going to just decorate it. It doesn't really matter what you do as long as it kind of makes sense. So you can, you know, do all the things you expect, like hold shift and draw lines, which are really good. And you can build little floating in the air platforms by selecting multiple things. It's really fun to just play with this. I might not put that one there, actually. Put that one there. 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 And because I haven't got time to explain how to make a player that can't go out of bounds, I'm actually just going to build a box around the whole level, which is really convenient for stuff like this. So I'm just going to go... Big line here, big line here, big line, big line. I'm going to go over here a bit more and then do another one up here. And then you get the idea. So I'm just making a box basically, so nothing bad can ever happen. <laughs> he says. Uh, and then I'm going to make another platform over here. Put that one there and then just stretch that all the way across there. Oops. Stretch that all the way across there. Okay. And then for a bit of variety, I'll put some up here as well. Here, here. I have no idea if this level's even jumpable with my character, but we'll see. Uh, that's, that's good enough. So now we have this, this lovely level. Uh, that's fantastic. It's a bit ugly with the, the background. So if I run this right now, God, I will attempt to build it and then show me what it sees. So it's kind of just seeing the top. The bottom, actually, which is not great. And that gray background is a bit ugly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a texture to the background. So I'm going to add another child node called texture rect, which is here, which just displays the texture. And the texture rect is looking for a texture. See, it's empty here. So in my assets, I've got this green over here. I'm just going to pick that up, drag it into the empty slot. And you'll see we've got this green thing sitting here now. And I'm just going to be really lazy and put that there set it to tile, and then scale it. So we'll end up with this nice texture behind the level. And you'll see it's currently in front of my level. That's because the ordering in this thing matters. So if I change this stuff here, it'll be behind it. So now we've got this kind of like thing that kind of looks like Sonic, which is good. That's exactly what we're going for. Uh, we need a player. So 
you'll still see if I run this. So if I push Command R or click the play button, Godot will compile this game and run it for me. Uh, first, I'll actually ask, because I've now got multiple scenes, it'll ask me which one I want the main scene to be. I want it to be the level. So I'm going to say select current, but it doesn't usually matter. You'll still see the perspective's a bit wrong. We'll fix that in a minute by adding a camera to the scene. A camera is literally what it sounds like. It shows you what you want it to see. So to fix this, I'm going to go back to the player. Actually, first of all, I'm going to add the player. Why not? We'll add the player. So I'm going to zoom in on my scene here and drag. Remember, we saved the player as a scene. You see down here, this T-scene thing. I'm going to drag that into the scene and put it just there. So you'll see it's this entity which encapsulates the entirety of that player scene into one thing. Let me just put it on the ground there, and then I'm going to save that. Now if I run that, we won't be able to see anything different because it'll still be that weird perspective, but rest assured, the player is up there somehow. <laughs> I'm doing that deliberately just so you can see that like, it doesn't automatically show you what you want it to show. If I save that, Command S, and go back to the player scene, so you'll see the scenes are sort of assembling in tabs up here, and you get a little preview of what they are. Uh, I am going to make a camera. So, first thing I'm going to add to the player scene is I'm going to add a remote transform. Remote transform basically says, I am a position somewhere in the world, and I would like you to be able to tell, you, tell something else about my location. We need that because we want the camera to follow the player. So by giving the player a remote transform, the player has a position that can be broadcast to other things. So I've added the remote transform, and then I'm going to add a camera. Camera 2D. So we have multiple new things in this scene now. And in the camera 2D, we don't actually need to change anything. We just want to leave it exactly alone. We can do some smoothing, so you know, like some games it kind of follows you slightly behind your actual movement. It automatically does that if you want it, but we're not going to do anything there. We're going to go for it on this remote transform 2D. I'm going to click it. And then in the inspector, I'm going to say remote path, assign, and I'm going to tell it to broadcast its position to the camera. So now basically I'm saying, camera, your position is wherever the remote transform tells you to be. Then I'm going to save that scene, and then I'm going to return to the level, and we're going to run it again the level which is embedding the player, remember? And you'll see now the camera is kind of follow, following the player. The player can't move, but the camera is following the player. It's kind of tiny. I don't really like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quit that, go up to this project settings, go to the window, and say the window should be 1440 by 900 maybe, something like that. Oh, good. My computer's doing weird things again. Thank you. Thank you, computer. <laughs> Love that. And uh, the scale should be five or six. Let's go with six. Six. Now we should end up with something that looks a lot more like a game. So the, the camera is actually in a reasonable position now. So if I, could move, if I could move this player, this would be great. Can't though. So we're going to add a script to the player. The script is going to let us control the player and adjust its behavior, make it so it can die and things like that. I'm going to go player. So I'm on my player node. I'm going to click the player. I'm going to click this little add script button. And I'm going to say I would like a new script. I'm, I'm going to ask for a script that is in uh, C sharp, not GD script, just because I don't want to teach you GD script today. I want to teach you C sharp with Unity. Uh, I got it. It's much more fun, and it's a great way to bring over people who use Unity. It inherits from character body 2D, which is the root kind of the node we made the player. And we're going to say we want the basic movement script. So you can have a completely empty script, but Godot comes with a bunch of basic <laughs> scripts for things you might want to do. So standard 3D and 2D movement, that's kind of free. So we're going to let it do that. Uh, we're going to call it player.cs, because why not? And we're going to create. And it's going to file up VS Code, because I've said that's my preferred external editor. So... Here is the default script it's given us. It sets some speed. Uh, a jump velocity. It's importing a global property for gravity, which is just a thing you can define, how far, fast it pulls things down. And we have a physics process function, which is called every tick, which is how we move things in a game world, which is basically checking if you're on the floor. So if you're not on the floor, on the floor is a function in Godot, which I'm going to save this and quit, so hopefully it starts uh, auto-completing code with a bit of luck. Here we go. OK, so on floor is a function that Godot provides that basically says, oh, of course it doesn't, whatever. On floor is a function that Godot provides that basically says, am I touching something else? So if, if it will return true of it is. If we're not on the floor, we're probably in the air, which means we need to apply gravity. That's all this is doing. Uh, this is checking if a key is pressed and is jumping. If so, by applying the jump velocity to the Y value of the, the character. And this is checking if you're pushing left or right and basically changing the vector you're pointing accordingly. That's all this function is doing. Then we call this magic move and slide function, which basically just magically automatically tells Godot to move it. 
In Godot 3, you used to have to pass the velocity and the, 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 the magnitude into move and slide. Now it just uses the values on the thing it's currently attached to. So whatever you call move and slide on, it pulls the, the numbers it needs for you. So now if I run this, simply by having attached the script, and you'll see now the player, if I select the player and look at the player's inspector over on the right, you'll see it's got a script attached. If I run this now after selecting the, uh, saving the scene and then selecting the level scene, we can move the player. Or can we? We'll see. <laughs> so I can move it. So if I'm, if I'm really quick, if I'm really quick while it starts, you see I can... <laughs> so I do have control over the player, but it's not quite what we wanted. That's because there's no uh, f physical barriers on any of the stuff in this world. So to fix this, we actually need to say there are colliders on things. So the first thing I'm going to add a collider to is the player. So I'm going to go back to this player scene and go... Well, actually, you can see here this, this little error, which has been there all along, has been telling us the node has no shape. So it can't collide or interact with other objects. Just because this thing has a picture of a player character doesn't mean the game engine knows that the shape of that player character maps to that picture. So we need to add a collider. So I'm going to add a child node of collision shape 2D. You'll notice there's 3D versions of all the things I'm saying. Godot does 2D and 3D. Sometimes I teach this as 3D. If you want to watch a 3D version of this tutorial, go look at LCA talks from a year or two ago. I did one there with a different game. Uh, so I'm going to add a collision shape here. And then I'm going to go over here on the collision shape and tell it what shape it is. I like to use capsules. So I've created a capsule shape. And you'll see here now we have this little capsule around the player. I'm going to make it a little bit smaller and make it touch his feet. And I'm going to save that. So now if we go back to the level, we will not fall through the ground. Or, or maybe not, we'll see. Oh, the ground also needs a collider, right? So to do this, because we're using a tile map, we have to collect the tile map, which is this thing. And then we have to say, over here in the properties of this tile map, we have to say we would like a physics layer. And you'll see here, if you're paying attention, that you can add multiple physics layers and mask them against each other. So you can have physics layers that only cause collisions but do not report those collisions, or you can have physics layers that do not cause collisions but report when they intersect something. So you can use that for detecting when you've hit certain objects. We're just going to go with the simple option and make one physics layer. Because I've added a physics layer, I now need to define what shape belongs to each of these tiles. Uh, we haven't got time to be fancy, so I'm just going to select the entire... Uh, whoops, that was the wrong button. I'm going to select the entire... Uh, tile map here, just by dragging, and I'm going to click on this button, and then I'm going to go down to here, and go here. I'll explain what I'm doing in one second. So I've just selected all these tiles, oh, I haven't. I've selected all of these tiles in this inspector, which kind of is the inspector for the tiles you currently have selected. There's a physics section, and I'm going to say we need a shape. So you can draw a polygon on here if you wanted to get fancy and do it manually, but if I just push F, it will fill a shape to the square. So now every single one of these tiles, no matter which one I pick, if you see it on the bottom there, has a square collider on it. That's good for now, good enough. Saving that, running. Now we sit on the ground, and because I've mapped the controls, it works. So that's pretty good. That's a good start. Oh, he's colliding. That's a good start. So we can also, we can also jump, which is nice. We can get up there, but we can't do the traditional platforming thing of jumping through from the bottom, which kind of sucks. And we slide and we don't animate, which is also a bit crap. Uh, let's fix the animation first. So to fix the animation, we're going to go back to that player in our player scene and click the player sprite and add some more animations. So I've got a couple more animations. Uh, we have jump, which is just a single frame. Because when you jump, you just want to basically... <laughs> Right? It is still technically 20 FPS, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, we also want a move animation, which is not a single frame. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 by 1. So it's segmented it again based on what I just told it. The screen is not updating. That is very exciting. <laughs> when did it stop updating? I am cursed today. Oh, good. That's, 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 that's totally mysterious. I've been presenting off this laptop for weeks with no problem. It's fine. OK, let's keep going. Select all those frames, add those frames I just made. So I basically just split that frames up based on 12 by 1. So now we have a nice move animation. It looks great. It's 20 FPS, right? Looks fantastic. Uh, what other animations do I need to add? 
do, 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 do. You do not, because you're just going to flip the sprite. Uh, I am very lazy. That's good for now. So I'm going to save that, and then I'm going to go back into the player script. So to make this actually animate, we need to get a handle on that animated sprite node to, so we can instruct it to change its animation when different things happen in the code. To do, to do that, I'm going to add a property up here. Because my autocomplete is working, it would never stop working. There we go. Actually, there we go. Great. Animated sprite 2D, your remember, is the same type as this node. So we're going to say we want an animated sprite 2D, player sprite. And then in ready, which we don't have currently, so we're going to go public override void. I think it's called ready. Yep. So this function is called when something is instantiated into the scene only once. And because ready, we want to get a handle on the player sprite. So to do that, we get node of type animated sprite 2D. And I'll explain what I'm doing in a second. Then we put the name in here. So this thing is called player sprite. My biggest complaint with Godot now is it loves strings. It uses strings for literally everything, even when you're using a language where there are better options. So for whatever reason, and it makes sense with GD script and made sense long ago when they created it, and it's a thing lots of other game engines do as well, you refer to everything by its string name, which is just weird to me, but it works. It seems like it could be fragile under certain circumstances. So basically we're saying there is an animated sprite 2D called player sprite, and when you are spawned into the scene, please inspect your node tree and find an animated sprite 2D node of name player sprite and assign it to that. If you use GDScript, there is shorthand which does all of that in one go. So it's one of the negatives of using C Sharp. Anyway, we have a handle on the, uh, the player sprite now. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to basically change the sprite when we need to change the sprite. So if you're on the floor, sorry, if you're not on the floor, so if gravity's happening, we need to do some cer certain things. So because we're, we're jumping, if, if we're inside this right here, we are jumping. That's what we need to know. So if velocity dot y is jumping, basically, change the player sprite to jump. It'll change that one frame animation of it going like that. Um, otherwise, play fall, because we're not on the floor, but we're not jumping, which means we're falling. And I'll set the full sprite up in a minute. That's one I forgot to do. Uh, that's everything we need to do there. Otherwise, so if we are not on the floor, which means we are not not on the floor, if we are not is on floor, which means we are on the floor, we then need to, sorry, my C sharp code style is terrible, by the way. Don't judge me. Uh, if velocity.x is zero, that means we are idle. So we are not jumping, we're not falling, we are not moving either. We play idle. Else, play a sprite, play move. So that's everything we need to do there. I need to go back and add a full sprite. So basically, I'm missing a bracket. Missing a bracket. On, 27. On 27, I'm missing a bracket. Oh, yeah. Is positive y up or down? <laughs> Currently, it's <laughs> up. Yeah, I think it's up. But you, could, you can change that. Just to be confusing. Down. So, yes, so it's the other way around. Yes, very good. <laughs> um, okay, so one thing I do in my daily life is I work with Unreal Engine, Godot, and Unity, and they all have completely different coordinate systems, and it just does my head in. I also program Swift, C Sharp, Rust, and a bunch of other languages, so I forget semicolons, brackets. Don't mind me. I do know how to program, I'm just very stupid. Um, <laughs> So here we have a thing that's basically saying if we're, if we're on the floor and not moving, play idle. If we're on the floor and moving, play move. If we're in the air uh, and jumping, play the jump animation. If we're in the air and falling, play the fall animation. The only, and we got a handle to the thing that lets us play the animation. The only thing I forgot to do is any, I don't think I added the, the fall animation to the sprite. So I'm going to add another animation here. I think I call it fall. And I'm pretty sure it is just a single frame of falling. I think it's just the exact opposite of the jump animation. Yeah. OK. So we're going to save that and run. And we'll see what, what stupid mistake I've made. So now he runs. He runs backwards still. We'll fix that in a minute. And he can jump. That's yeah, pretty good. That looks pretty good to me. So now we're going to make him flip the other way when he, when he needs to go the other way. Um, that's a bit disappointing. So. In our 
player script. We're going to go down to the line. Da, 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 this one here. And basically say, this is if we are moving. So if we do not have a, a zero vector. Uh, we're going to say if velocity.x is zero, then we want to play it. What, did I, what have I done? Oh my gosh. I'm so stupid, don't mind me. Player sprite dot flip h. And hopefully that's obvious what that does. It flips it on the horizontal. Else, uh, if, actually we need an if there, if velocity dot x is greater than zero, then player sprite flip. Uh, actually, I'm going to do it a different way. Equals true. Flip h equals false. Sorry, I've changed my mind on that a few times. So basically, depending on which direction we're facing, flip the sprite. So that should now feel significantly better. And I ran the player scene. You can see what happens. I ran the player scene, which means we get the player doing nothing. I'm going to run the correct scene now. So hopefully now, go that way, it goes that way, go that way, it goes that way. Pretty good, right? So what time? We've got time for a couple more things. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to add is these platforms don't feel very good to jump at because you want to go through them and land on the top. Thankfully, God knows that you're probably making a stupid little platform game and makes that easy. <laughs> very easy. So back in here where we set up the physics collision for the platforms, if I select all of these again, and because I'm tremendously lazy, I'm just going to do it to all of them. Realistically, you'd want to carefully map out a polygon for each of these so you don't end up with all doing the same thing. So you'll see this polygon is a square. If we go down here to the polygon we've defined and tick one way, you'll notice they're now all one way, <laughs> which basically means they only collide on the top. You can change the direction that arrow points, and you can give it kind of like a feather, like a, a, a limit where you can still pass through it. And I'm going to run... Yes, but I have not got time to show you that. But yes, you can absolutely do that. So now if I jump up at the platforms, I should be able to go through them and land on the top. Which feels good already, right? <laughs> I haven't designed this level very well, but it's, it's a nice feeling. Okay, so we have about, what, 10 minutes left? I think that's probably enough time to make an enemy. So I'm going to tempt fate. <laughs> the enemy is already the HDMI cable, but we'll, uh, we'll see how this goes. So I'm going to make a brand new scene. Okay, I made a new scene, and this scene is going to be very similar to our player. It's going to have a character body 2D as the root. You're very mature. You don't laugh when I say root. That's great. Most of the people, most of the people laugh at all the stupid things game engines call stuff because you've got like root nodes, you've got like empty children, you've got all sorts of stuff that like people just giggle at. So I'm very impressed with you all. Uh, we have an enemy, which is just a, a character body 2D. Again, I'm going to add an animated sprite so the player can actually see the enemy doing something. Enemy sprite, and once again, I'm going to add an animation to that sprite over here, and my mouse has stopped working again. I love that. I'm going to give it a second. There we go. New sprite. Click. You still see? Yep. Okay. Cool. Uh, this player needs a move animation. Sorry, this enemy needs a move animation, and we're going to add my enemy frames. That is definitely not on my end. That is so weird. No, this is the, so, so, I don't know, <laughs> don't know. <laughs> My, yeah, there's, this, it's an entirely different visual. I'm going to go with that something weird God is doing with the drawing context. It doesn't mean like being projected, but uh, we'll see. Let's see if I can make it full screen. <laughs> so yeah, no, no I, don't, I don't know what's going on there. That's weird. This is very un unique. <laughs> really, you can, you can actually see the mouse cursor, but not the con. Okay, we're going to unplug it and do that again. This is fun. It's okay, we still have time to make an enemy. Oh, I hate computers. I'm ready to give up on the whole tech industry, honestly. Um, okay. Yep. Can you see this? Okay, so I'm adding a run animation, which, which is uh, 9 to 12. That's so weird. Okay, select uh, clear frames. There we go. There's 12 frames of a little frog dude. Looks very menacing. We'll play him. He's 20 FPS as well. 
very menacing little frog. Uh, I'm going to add a collision shape to the frog so he can actually collide with things and give it another capsule. So he needs the capsule to touch the bottom roughly. Yep, that's good enough. And I'm going to save this as enemy and add a script to him. Again, we're just going to leave it as default, basic movement. So if I left this as it is now, we'd be driving both characters at once with the input. So I'm going to actually delete a lot of this. I just wanted to get the basics. So I'm going to actually go over here and get a script I prepared earlier. Uh, just because I don't want to have to type all this. I'll explain what I've done though. So this player, this enemy class gets a handle on the enemy sprite, which is the thing we just made. We're not using that yet, so I'll delete that. And when it's ready, it gets a, gets a reference to that. And then as it moves, it checks if it's on a wall. We don't want that either, sorry. Uh, it moves and it flips its sprite accordingly. <laughs> so if it hits a wall, so it's kind of one of those enemies that kind of hits a wall and then bounces back and goes the other way and go, keeps going. So if it hits a wall, it flips its direction. That's all it does. So is on wall is very similar to is on floor. It just checks if you're touching something on the sides. These are all just convenience functions that Godot provides. You could write all this manually yourself by checking the direction of things, but you don't need to. So we say if we flip the sprite, if we're going one way, flip the other way, otherwise we just move. And it just goes back and forth. So that's all this is going to do. Just make sure it's called sprite. And here, enemy sprite. I'm going to save that into the level. I'm going to make an area for this enemy to go, because you'll see there's actually no spot for him to sit currently. So I'm going to go into the tile map, click this button, lay the tile map out. Sorry, I have to click a few things before it works. Now I'm going to put a block here. And I'm going to extend the floor a little bit. So it can go there. And then I'm going to put another block here. This is a really silly level, but you get the idea. So now down here, we have an enemy. We're going to drag him into the level and put him there. And I'm going to drag him down onto the ground. And hopefully, if I run this, he'll go back and forth in that spot he's in. Nope, currently he's not. Let's find out what I did wrong. Ooh, debugger, how convenient. <laughs> Count instance script, make sure the script exists. OK, so the problem here is this is capital E and the script is not. <laughs> so we're just going to rename that. Oh my gosh. I'm just going to I'm just going to quit Godo and unplug and plug back in and I'm going to show you the final version because clearly that's not fun and we've got 7 minutes left or so. So, basically that enemy was going to go back and forth in one scene and not do much of anything. Here is the final version of this little project which I'll give you the source code to before we finish today. Is that can you see anything? Oh my gosh. MCEC. There we go. Okay. This is the final version that I made to test this. It's exactly the same as the code you just seen. It all just works. Uh, <laughs> except for the freaking room. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to fix this, but there is a full game that you can download on Git. I will send you the link now so you can see. It is very, very fun for you to play with this and it means you can learn. So if anyone wants to play with this outside of the screen that constantly flickers, you can look at my GitHub, which is parisba, P-A-R-A-S-B-A, and it's eo 23 Godot. And I have no idea why this is just flickering at me now. I'm going to give it one final attempt to show you the final version of this game. And otherwise, I'm giving up. But you get the idea. Godot is a very simple way to build games out of pieces, and you can basically build things out of these modular components that make it very simple to not have to think about too much. Why is this flickering? Not have to think about too much about what's going on and whether you need to make things relate to each other in a certain way, because they kind of all just talk to each other in a way that makes sense. I'm going to give it one final attempt to show you, and we'll give up. Computer. Yep. Okay, so you can get a, a copy of the game here. All the source code of the final version is there. Please, please play with it. It's really quite fun. All the credits for the art. I did not make any of the art, by the way. I stole it all. It's all CC0 or CC BY. Um, you can find me on Mastodon there. And we're writing a book on Godot, which will be great. That's not out yet. That's just totally a placeholder page. But follow me on social or bookmark that link if you want to play with it. Um, here's the final version of the game, which is all the same features you just saw. This enemy is exactly the same code that we were just making. He just goes back and forth and hits the thing. Uh, there is another enemy up the top somewhere. 
which does the same thing but stays on a platform. That's accomplished by pointing ray casts, which are basically perfect lasers that tell you when they're hitting something down on either side and then tell if one stops detecting something, it flips and points the other way. There are also coins you can collect in this version, so you can jump up on platforms and collect coins. You'll see the coin go up in the corner, and if I jump on one of these frogs, it will kill me and respawn me. All this code for this version is in the repo. So if anyone wants to play with this, you can grab this. Lots of people, the most frequent question I get asked about Godot is should you learn GDScript or C Sharp? I don't love C Sharp. I think it's a great language, but I don't, love, I don't enjoy using it. I think it's got lots of great features, but I don't enjoy writing code in it. That said, I think if you want to do this professionally or make big games for real, you should do C Sharp just because there's a bigger community of stuff out there and you can bring all sorts of random DLLs in that do all sorts of good stuff from the massive library of stuff that people have done in the Mono and .NET community. Um, if you are just doing this for fun, then pick whatever language you enjoy. GDScript is really easy to use and there's lots of convenience helpers, which means you don't need to initialize stuff on Ready. You just say, I would like a handle on my animated sprite and it gives you one. It's much easier to use. It's also all built into the Godot editor. So I would say GDScript for hobbying, hobbying or, use, or playing or building games with your kids. C Sharp for anything slightly more serious than that. Uh, other than that, I'm happy to take questions if anyone has any questions and my computer keeps cooperating. But thank you for listening. Apologies for the tech issues. You've been a great audience regardless. Uh, thank you, Paris. That was great. And we should apologize, I think, oh, for the so tech issues more than... More than uh, Presented in this convention center so many times and something's gone wrong every time. Yeah. But luckily, the next day people are here because they're actually good at their job. <laughs> uh, any questions for Paris? Yes. Anyone? Yep. Um, I was just wondering, do you know if there's any performance differences between GDScript and C Sharp? C Sharp is significantly more performant. Um, you can also bridge it to C++ and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, I say it's significantly more performant, that is because that is strictly true. Whether that actually makes a difference when you're building a silly little video game is another question. <laughs> Look at this, it's just working perfectly now. You call it, you use um, Godot and Unreal and um, Unity. When would you choose to use Godot? Until recently, I would not have chosen to use Godot for a professional project. So we build games for a living. I've been doing that for 15 years. I would not have chosen Godot until recently. Uh, <laughs> I would not choose this HDMI cable slash this room. Um, no. Godot, as of Godot 4, if you want to make a 2D game, it is as good or better than any of the proprietary options. If you want to make a 3D game, it really depends on what you're doing. It is a lot messier in the 3D space than it is in the 2D space, simply because Godot, as I understand it, Godot started as a 2D engine and they kind of added 3D features. So it was an afterthought in terms of the architecture. It works great, it's very powerful. You can functionally make anything in all of these game engines now. They're all equivalent feature-wise if you're willing to put the work in. But Godot makes 2D games a lot easier than Unity right now, in my opinion. And it's got a better feature set. It's also free and there's like 100 megabytes of RAM and 100 megabytes to download and doesn't require licensing servers and all sorts of garbage. Practically, the only consideration where you would want to use Unity over Godot for a 2D game that you're starting right now is if you have an established team with Unity knowledge. Or, and this is a big or, you are deploying to a proprietary platform like the Switch, Xbox, or PlayStation, where you currently, for myriad technical and legal reasons, Godot makes that difficult. Because basically those platform holders require that you certify the code you're running on them. The open source thing of Godot can never be certified the same way as things. So you need a proprietary fork of Godot, which is licensed differently to go through the cert process at Microsoft, Nintendo. It's the usual proprietary problem. Um, there are companies that have special license versions of Godot will do that porting for you. So if that is actually a thing, you can still solve it. It's not insurmountable. Not great. Yeah? Are these... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. My bad. I, bring it back. I broke the rules. Sorry. <laughs> Let's go with this one. First, second. Oh, oh, yeah, my fault, sorry. My apologies. All right, good. Um, yeah. So I've been following Godot loosely for a long time. And yeah. back in the day, there were bindings for other languages yep. for use with the Godot engine, but they're always kind of cumbersome. Has that changed with GD Native and stuff? Has it gotten a bit better, or are you still kind of struggling? It's a little even... bit better. Okay. It's more mature in that they've like taken the weird janky thing they had for years, and it's now got an ecosystem. So it's a, a kind of a janky ecosystem. So it's better than it used to be, but it's still not great. Uh, if you are binding C Sharp stuff from like the whole world of .NET, that's actually really good. That works great. But if you're trying to do anything else, it's a bit fiddly. Yes. I was just wondering if you have run this workshop with kids and how, how that works or what age groups it works with, your yeah. experience with that? 
Uh, look, I haven't run this. I haven't run anything with Godot 4. This is the first audience I've spoken to Godot 4 about, just because it's so new. Uh, we've, we've taught a lot of kids game development with a lot of different technologies. Kids pick it up from like seven years old, eight years old and above. They're pretty savvy. Um, I would recommend if you're teaching kids Godot, use GDScript just because it's one program. You don't have to explain jumping out to VS Code. And like kids don't care about VS Code extensions and the marketplace and installing the C Sharp. It's, it's just kind of a nightmare you don't need. Whereas GDScript is just like, I would show you if my computer was actually doing anything of use. GDScript is all in the Godot editor. It has a text editor inside the Godot editor. So when you click the script, it opens that in. in it's got autocomplete. It just works. The documentation's built in. There's a pane you can open. It's great. But it's a weird proprietary. It's a weird proprietary language that doesn't exist anywhere else, but it's fine for teaching kids. Um, has you, have you or your team uh, looked at the uh, effort that would be going into refactoring a project from Unity to uh, Godot well, and uh, I guess just the interoperability yeah. at the moment between the two? Um, Look, re like re platforms. refactoring a project is basically a nice way of saying you would have to rewrite it from scratch. So moving between game engines, it's basically a complete rewrite. That said, Unity, C Sharp, Godot, C Sharp, of course, if you have some underlying libraries that are C Sharp, that's just code that will work. So if you abstracted your game to the point where you could just call some library to ask it what you needed to do, then maybe you could port it relatively simply. But so much of a game engine is assembling things in some sort of visual sense in a scene that you would still have to do all that in Godot, and there's no reason to automatically translate that because that would just be weird. So you could do it, but I wouldn't recommend it. It's basically a rebuild from scratch. Um, yeah. Yeah? Um, I asked this question as a mobile app developer who's never yeah. done games, yeah. but I have heard that uh, Unity is a bit of a pain in terms of version control and yes. uh, version management. Is Godot any better on that Godot's front? Godot is fantastic with version control. Unity, um, Unity until recently was a pain. It created these like weird, weird, big weird binary blobs that basically required you to use Perforce if you wanted to use any sort of version control. And then a few years ago, Unity remembered that Git exists and started supporting that in the editor. Um, and that's kind of fine now. Godot natively supports Git. So let's tempt fate here. Let's, when you create a new project in Godot, it asks you, it relaunches. When you create a new project in Godot, it asks you if you want to create version control metadata. And currently it only supports Git, but I think that's a modular system you can plug stuff into. So it makes it very neat to work with Git. Works fantastically. It can be diffed in everything. You can diff the scene file. <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> I think we could do one or two more. If I'm happy to take a couple of questions. I've got Otherwise, uh, yeah, we will say thanks again, Paris, and another round of applause. For you. Thank you.